in any society, going against the establishment, going against the elite, standing up for what you believe is right, expressing your views, all these things are difficult and there's always a price to pay. Now my research argued that the uh, Operation Cold Store, right, the use of detention without trial by Lee Kuan Yew and the PAP government in 1963 had uh, no basis in security but was really a political operation uh, to eliminate the political opposition to Lee Kuan Yew. But very rapidly, I ran into a lot of trouble because uh, there was a lot of unhappiness from uh, the establishment, apparently, about me talking about my research. I was no longer welcome in Singapore academia. I was blacklisted. I would never be able to work in uh, any university in Singapore again. Um, I remember being told no extension, no renewal, no alteration of my contract and no new contract. Right? They were, it was uh, very clear about, about that. Because they want to keep us beaten down. Because fundamentally they fear, an, an, um, they fear an empowered, enlightened Singapore citizenry because it was an empowered, enlightened Singapore citizenry which got rid of the British and brought them in in the first place and they don't want it to happen to them. There was never any evidence that the Operation Cold Store detainees were engaged in any communist conspiracy. And I'll say this again, in case the microphone malfunction, or the cameras didn't capture it, or you guys didn't, didn't hear it the first time. You want to take out your phones and record me, go ahead. I will say this one more time, loud and clear. I want to make this very, very clear. I mean, they painted me as like dishonest and all that, but I have never like advocated for, you know, I've never taken part in a protest or advocated for like drastic overnight change or I'm here to talk about the, you know, to educate people about the system and how things work and help them understand, right? And I guess in some ways speaking the truth is a radical act. They say they have evidence. They say they, ha they have proof that the detainees were up to no good. They don't. We know they don't. But let's say they did, right? They, you know, why then, why not release the evidence? All government information is a state secret by definition unless they choose to declassify things, which, you know, they only declassify things which are to their advantage or which make them look good. You know, we don't have enough information. Let us learn the truth. Because what is the worst that could happen to them? Either they're right or we, the people of Singapore, learn the truth together and we use the truth to build a better Singapore with justice for all. This um, old man came up to me and told me that because of my work, he could look his children and his family in the eye again. And he said to me, PJ, you've given me my pride and my dignity back. During, I think, late 2013 into 2014, um, I was giving public lectures about my findings and a former detainee actually came up to me after one of my lectures. He explained that he had been detained without trial in Cold Store in 63 and held for several years. And so he had felt very guilty and ashamed about this all these years. But I came along 50 years later with the actual arrest documents, there was no evidence that there was any link to the communists in what he was doing. So because of this, he said to me, um, he could look his wife and children in the eyes again, right? And he said to me, PJ, you've given me my pride and my dignity back. And this is a really powerful moment that has never left me. Because to know that you can make a difference to someone's life like that, right? Just by researching and writing the truth, you can make someone 
so, you know, changed their lives so profoundly for the better. Because it shows that the work we do makes a difference. The truth can make a difference in people's lives. It is such a privilege to be able to do that. And it, this, this keeps me going, to know that I can make a difference gives a lot of what I do a lot of meaning. I think I'm very, very lucky because I have parents who raised me to question authority, right? And if I had parents who, you know, every time something uh, happened to me that was unjust, just rolled over and said, oh, you know, it's, that's how the system works, then I'd be very different. I think I was very fortunate uh, in my upbringing, in the fact that I went to good schools, um, I was raised as a, you know, in a, I mean, I am a Methodist and I think in a, in a Christian tradition which emphasized service and social justice. I was raised not to simply accept authority but to always be very critical um, towards it. Um, I think also being an athlete, I have a very different sort of visceral relationship to the flag, to my country, to my people. You know, I, and I'm serving society and humanity in general. So all these things, I think I was very lucky, you know, and mentors along the way, people who very much encouraged this attitude uh, towards service, right? And uh, I'm not really fussed about doing it in a way which is legitimized by a certain elite group. The strongest determinant of elite status in Singapore is proximity to the inner circle of PAP leadership. The elite are overwhelmingly male, they're overwhelmingly ethnic Chinese, they're overwhelmingly upper class, they've attended a narrow range of schools. I think something more than 90% of scholarship holders come from just four schools. I think two thirds from just two schools, right? <laughs> And of course, because they're overwhelmingly male, they have, uh, most of them have actively served in the military as scholar officers. Singapore, under the PAP, has become more conservative, more elitist, more quote-unquote Chinese, so to speak. So, these are friends, these are colleagues, these are relatives, people with talent, people who are very smart, but people who thought very much like the, the leaders of the PAP. And so power became increasingly concentrated in the hands of a very narrow elite. And over time, this, meant, this has meant increasing homogeneity of thought, of values, of experience. They think alike, they feel alike, they believe the same things. But, you know, it also shows the weakness of that system because um, I think there are a lot of things w which academics don't measure, right? Um, you know, courage and discipline and perseverance and moral conviction. There are a lot of people who can serve our country in very different ways, uh, who have very different talents, who are not necessarily selected by that system, which is looking for something far more specific. I think we should ask ourselves, how can we be better? How can we create a better society? How can we, you know, protect the rights of minorities, of, of uh, the, the voiceless, of the, the people who are disempowered, who have less power. You're uh, an activist for women's rights. Tell us, why is it important to have women in parliament? We have a very complicated relationship with freedom in Singapore, right? With independence, with Medeca. Because we have a very paternalistic government. You know, the ability to influence uh, where you live, who you marry, you know, what your job is, even your definition of self, right? What race you are. We need to start with the overall structure, which can be summed up in this phrase. We don't have free and fair elections. We are not a democracy. I'm so lucky that I have a family who are so ultimately supportive of me, that they've been, you know, been there to get me through tough times where I didn't have a salary. I, I, I mean, I can't deny it's exhausting. You know, it's, there's, there's a lot of fear, you know, the, the, just the constant uh, worry. Yeah, I, I, I can't predict the future. I'll just keep going as long as I can, as long as my mind and body are able to do so.